welcome again to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and thanks for joining us for another season of Wintertime Gardening. On today's program, we'll be helping you keep your grass green and weed free. We'll help you demystify terms like organic, natural, and GMO free on the products we see at the garden center. And we'll help new gardeners store and check the viability of their seeds. We'll start off today's show by hearing from Extension Turf Specialist Cole Thompson about dormant seeding of turf. So dormant seeding is a process where you're actually, apply, you're actually seeding a lawn at a time of year when that seed's not going to germinate because the soil temperatures are too cold. And so if you weren't able to seed a cool season lawn at the preferred time of year, which is in fall, and that lawn is thin and needs improvement, uh, we can actually seed that lawn over winter, usually from the months of November to March or even April in some areas in Nebraska, and get that seed in place so that it'll germinate right away in spring when the soil temperatures are warm enough uh, to, to allow that seed to germinate. And so we can actually do the same thing with warm season grasses where the preferred seeding time is in spring, but we can get a little bit of a head start by dormant seeding and again, having that seed in place uh, when, it's, when the soil temperatures are conducive to germination. So you wanna follow the same types of seed bed preparation procedures that you would for a fall or spring seeding. You still wanna control persistent weeds. You wanna disturb the top quarter inch of soil uh, to, to ensure that you have some loose soil for seed to soil contact um, or even rototill and, and firm the soil if you have a lot of uh, surface issues where the soil is not smooth or there's a lot of pit, potholes or something like that. After we've prepared the seed bed, really all you need to do is spread the seed and walk away because that seed doesn't need anything until spring when it's germinating. So we'll apply starter fertilizers, wait for natural irrigation, and then control any weeds that pop up in the spring. Probably the most common issue is that it ends up being not that much different from a spring seeding, and so there will be lots of weed competition in the spring. And so you'll have to use herbicides and other management practices to control those weeds. Uh, another common mistake is not applying enough seed. Because, especially in Nebraska, there are times when we get warm spells during winter, some of this seed could actually germinate and start to grow. And so it's important to increase the seeding rate by about 25% compared to what you would do in the fall to account for some of that mortality. We also want to usually not use this process with fast germinating species like perennial ryegrass because more of that seed will germinate and you'll have more mortality over winter. So this is a better process for uh, tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, and even buffalo grass. So the important thing to remember is after a dormant seeding, we still need to treat the seed bed like a spring seeding when spring comes around. That means doing things like applying starter fertilizer, um, irrigating as appropriate, uh, and controlling any weeds that pop up with herbicides that are safe in seed beds. If your lawn is looking a little ragged at the end of the season and you missed your chance to get a fall seeding done, dormant seeding will help fill in those patches. As long as you get good seed to soil contact and treat it like a spring seeding, you should have good results. We started our Go Gardening features last year to help teach beginning gardeners the basics of growing plants the right way. Last year, we focused on getting soil prepared for a garden. Today, we're going to be giving you some tips and techniques for storing seeds and checking older seeds and packages for viability. We're starting this year's Go Gardening series with talking about seeds and not seed saving, but what do you do with those seeds after you've saved them? Are they still going to be viable? There are multiple ways to propagate plants and a lot of gardeners do like to collect seed, store it properly, bring it out the next year. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. Another way, of course, to propagate plants is cuttings. We have a whole bench full of beautiful cuttings behind us. That is another topic for another day. But let's talk about if you have saved seeds, how do you know whether they're going to actually produce good plants for you? Start by thinking a little bit about did you do it properly? Did you throw them into a sack in the garage and forget about them? Did you store them in a dry, cool place? Did you make sure that they didn't get moist or they didn't get rotten? Or, or like I said, did you just let them be and, and hope for the best? 
You want to look first at what is on the back of the seed packet if you have been somebody like I am who throws them into a box and sticks them in the closet, which is not what you're supposed to do. But what you want to look at is when were they packed? What is the pack date? And seed packets will tell you that they are packed for a certain date. You want to keep that in mind, especially as we head into 2018. I think I have a packet in here that says it was packed in 2004. That would be kind of old seed. Now, here's the deal with plants. Certain plants, and many of them, will actually grow only if it is what we call fresh seed. That means if it is packed for 2016 and you want to get it to germinate in 2018, you might have a low germination rate. One of the things that I like to do, and this, and this is a pretty common practice for gardeners, is if you're going to try to attempt to see how much of your seed is viable, you start that process before it's time to order the seeds. So you simply open that packet, you put some of those seeds in a wet paper towel, close over the top of the paper towel, don't have it too soggy, don't let it dry out, peek at it every now and then, and see how many of the seeds that you have put in this little moist environment actually are going to germinate. That gives you a pretty good indication that out of that particular packet, you will have a percentage of those seeds, whether it's a high percentage or a low percentage, that you can expect to germinate and produce a decent plant in the garden, again, if you do that next step properly. We hope you're enjoying our Go Gardening features that are really designed to help novice gardeners. So if you've tried gardening before and you have some old seed packets lying around, this method will help you figure out if you can still use those old seeds. On our landscape lesson this week, we're going to focus on garden trends for the upcoming season. Just like fashion trends, what's in last year is out and what's old is new again. Let's take a few minutes to hear about what's trending for the upcoming gardening season. We love to start the new year talking about all the great gardening trends. So for our very first landscape lesson of 2018, let's talk about what some of those are. I get a kick out of it because many of them are classic design principles. Let's create spaces that are relaxing. Let's use nature as the prescription for health and well-being. Let's create a sense of enclosure. Let's do alfresco dining, which means draw your, your guests and yourself out into your landscape rather than having that patio furniture smashed right up against the house. Water is a big one. Millennials are going to be spending more money on water. And of course, you can't live without it. It's soothing, it's beautiful. We also have some of the gardening trends that are a little bit different. Flexitarian, as an example, which means let's try to figure out how to grow our own protein in the gardens. A little bit trickier, unless you have a lot of space. We certainly are celebrating small spaces. Many people have big acreages, but it's those small spaces and creating places where you can relax, get a sense of meditation, enjoy nature. Those are really important places. We also have something called forest bathing, and it's not what it sounds like. It is actually taking a quiet, small walk in a, in a forest or in a canopied space where you have that incredible sense of relaxation, calm connection with nature. We always also have a color of the year. The Pantone color of the year this year is Purple Rain. And it's great to think of that in terms of the royals with a marriage. It's perfect to think of that with Prince, of course, Purple Rain. And purple in the garden can be an incredible, brilliant kind of a color. Another garden trend that we have been practicing for years is low input, low water use. The newer term is rainscaping which is putting plants that want the water in places where they need it, putting plants that don't in the places where they don't, using succulents, using the plants in, in, in the places where additional irrigation is going to be managed very carefully. And then we have what we love really best in our gardens in the backyard farmer area and in our courtyard, and that is let's let things be. Call it bedhead, call it cottage gardening, leave those seed heads standing, it's a little bit messier, it, it's certainly one of those kinds of things in the landscape that lets us attract wildlife to the gardens using berries and seeds and really repurposing how we use our spaces in the landscape. 
As always, your own personal style and taste will really determine what you want to plant this year. But don't be afraid to try something new, whether it be some different vegetables, planting some new ornamental varieties, or playing around with color. Your 2018 garden catalogs will be full of new ideas and plants to try. Speaking of trends, a lot of people are into organic gardening. But what does that word organic really mean? Does all natural really mean all natural? These words can sometimes confuse even the most seasoned gardener. For our first interview this year, we're going to hear from Nebraska Extension educator John Porter about what these words mean on the label and what they mean for you in the garden. I'm talking today with John Porter about what is an interesting and oftentimes controversial subject, which is organic, natural, non-GMO, GMO, touch the earth lightly, all of these different terms we use to describe both the products that we use in our landscapes, the food we eat, and the seeds we sow. So John, can you tell us the differences in the levels of organic certification, or are there differences? Yeah, if you look at a label, you might see different versions of organic on there. And so it's, it can be really important to know the difference. So sometimes you might just see organic and that may or may not have some sort of certification, someone behind it actually certifying that it is organic. Now, I will say that a lot of local small farmers might use the term straight organic uh, because the certification process can be expensive and, and long term. So a lot of them forego that and you basically have to have that relationship with them to know are they telling the truth or not. Uh, then you might see certified organic, uh, and there are sort of third-party organizations out there that will go around and, and certify organic farms or organic producers. So they might have their own set of criteria. Uh, and then you have USDA certified organic, and that's a set of criteria that's, that comes down from the USDA uh, that says you have to use these certain materials and practices. Uh, and so we have those certifiers that will go out and make sure that they're USDA certified. So I think that's the level of sort of least to most certification there and that's what you can see on all those different labels. So John, what about the word natural as applied to products or GMO versus non-GMO? So natural really doesn't have a real definition. There's no actual USDA definition. Uh, so companies can really use that however they want. Uh, and so there's, there's not really something set that it really means. It's, it can be pretty meaningless for, for some time. So, you know, if you're really wanting organic or, or some earth-friendly type of practice, look for the organic label rather than natural because that can be misleading sometimes. Now for the non-GMO versus the GMO, which is a, a big uh, topic of contention, so I'll first say that uh, a better term to use for that is genetically engineered because a lot of people sort of misuse the term GMO to mean anything that's a hybrid or uh, has some sort of genetic variation. And I could say that all humans are GMO because we are a hybrid of our parents' genes uh, and everything is a GMO because it has been crossbred at some point. But genetic engineering means that we've uh, used some sort of laboratory technique to insert or uh, extract genes uh, for some sort of trait. Uh, and so we look at those and we have non-GMO versus GMO uh, and I think there's a lot of confusion there. Uh, consumers have sort of been misled a little bit in some ways because a lot of the stuff that is labeled non-GMO really doesn't need that label because nothing, it has no counterpart that really exists. Uh, so lots of our, our fruit and vegetable seeds and plants, there are no GMO versions of it. Uh, so we look at that uh, and we want to make sure that uh, you know, we know exactly what we're getting and, and maybe look at those labels because sometimes that non-GMO label is put on there just so that the, the uh, store can charge a little bit more money for it. What exactly are you going to tell people about using these products in their landscapes? How should they make those decisions? Right, so I think, you know, looking, if they want to be sort of a, an organic gardener or low impact gardener, um, doing integrated pest management to avoid the problems in the first place is the best solution. Uh, and then don't be afraid. So a lot of people think that the term organic means that there's nothing ever sprayed on it. And that actually isn't true, especially in the grocery store. But even in the home garden, there are products that can be 
used to deal with diseases and insects. So if you're wanting to grow at home in an organic way, look for those products uh, that have that listing. A lot of them are derived from natural products like plants or bacteria or even minerals from the ground. So that's where I would focus on. There are organically certified seeds, but I think, you know, that isn't as big of an issue because how much actual pesticide, if there was some sprayed on that plant, is going to come through that seed? It's not very much. Uh, now, if you're doing organic certified, then yes, it is. But for home gardeners, uh, I wouldn't worry about that. And then for the non-GMO versus the GMO, most of the things we grow in the home garden do not have a genetically engineered counterpart. So if you look at a seed label and you say, I have to have a non-GMO tomato, well, guess what? All tomatoes are non-GMO, so don't be misled by that label thinking that you have to pay $5 for this pack of non-GMO tomato seeds versus you know, the $2 for the pack of non-GMO tomato seeds that are just as well. So I wouldn't even worry about that for home gardeners because they're not available to home gardeners. Thanks, John. I think that will really help our audience understand the differences between those terms and then make some good decisions about products, food, and what they're going to use in their landscapes. So read those labels carefully and really proceed with caution. The active ingredients will usually also tell you a lot more than the advertisement on the package. And your garden center professional or extension educator are also good sources of information if you're still not sure about what you're planting or what you're applying. Alrighty, let's switch gears for a few minutes to answer some viewer emails. We really love getting questions from you and we do hope that you'll keep us in mind if you've got something that's causing a problem in your gardens or in your landscape. You can send your questions and JPEG pictures to byf at unl.edu and it has to be to the email for the pictures. Our first question comes from a viewer in the Omaha area. She had a nine bark, a Diablo, which is one of the bigger, older purple foliage varieties. And probably based on our strange weather conditions this year, that shrub put on huge amounts of growth pretty late in the season. We don't recommend to people that they do any pruning after the 1st of August, really on most every plant unless it's a safety hazard. So what she can do next year um, is she can go ahead and take those canes back down to a set of buds in, pointing in the direction that you really want the growth to occur. You can take them all the way down if you want to, but then you're gonna get this interesting sort of strange shrubby growth right at the point of the cut. You also want to make sure that you understand when nine bark blooms, whether that is on buds that were set in the previous year, which means it's old wood, which means you prune after flowering, or in the current year. With those canes, I wouldn't worry about it because, if, because you really don't want that growth to go ahead and branch way up at the tip. This is going to be true on an awful lot of our plants that threw three or four or five feet of growth. Our second question is a really interesting one in terms of what happens when a utility company or a public works sort of uh, individual comes in and needs to do some marking in the landscape. This one isn't marking in the landscape per se, but what it is is the client had some painting done and the painters actually did a little bit of brush cleaning Looks like maybe a little bit of spill that was bright blue on the trunk of a tree and in the turf. They're concerned about what is the impact of that paint on the tree in particular. Can they get it off the tree? Will it harm the tree? They used latex paint, which is great because although latex is really no longer made from a rubber product, it is one that is a water-based uh, water paint. And so really no harm, no foul on this. If it's really bothersome, you can go ahead and take that paint off with a very, um, like a detergent, a, a light detergent and water solution, but it is not something that is going to cause great harm uh, to the tree. And interestingly enough, one of the things that is recommended, especially with fruit trees, is to go ahead and paint the trunks white with latex paint, which is actually one of the things that is a protective quality for those particular plants. Our third question comes to us from a Gretna viewer. who He backs up to a railroad right-of-way, and there's a huge drop. You can see that from the pictures. 
there have been a lot of old, probably junk trees, that's sort of the word we use for them, even though in certain situations these trees are not junk, that have come up in the railroad right of way. Mulberry, ash, um, some of the hackberries, the, the, the plants that are really spread easily by seed, sort of those, let's take over the earth kinds of plants. Uh, some of those big trees have been removed. Some of the others he has done as well, done some piling of the brush at the base. He's now discovering that he really has a steep slope, which he knew about to begin with. But he, there's a great concern about that soil eroding and, and really causing a lot of difficulty. So what he had hoped to do was be able to seed a ground cover that is actually very shade tolerant. That's a really tough one. Couldn't come up with a ground cover that is shade and drought tolerant in those situations that would be one that would be aggressive enough to actually cover that soil pretty immediately. So one of the things that we might suggest to him is go ahead and start some perennial ground covers, even if you're gonna to have to buy them in rooted cuttings or some small 32s or containers and get those started He'll want to use some erosion control material probably as well to hold that soil in place while the ground cover roots. Don't use landscape fabric. That is not something we recommend in pretty much most situations. But you can get the straw mat that is actually held in place with some netting. That would be a good option in this situation. You can just cut holes in that or poke holes in it. And of course, the straw deteriorates so the ground covers can root into it. I had a couple of suggestions for him. One of them that I know is used extensively on campus in these tough, full shade, hardly any irrigation, tree root competition locations, and that is Lamiastrum, the variegated one. Uh, spotted dead nettle is another name for that one. It will spread by, sto by stolons, rooting down like a strawberry plant does, cover a lot of soil pretty aggressively. Liriope is a plant that we're seeing a lot of use of all over the eastern part of the state in terms of sort of a grass-like texture. Again, it's a very thick plant. That one will spread as well. We have seen some seed production from that, from established plants, uh, but not much. There are also a couple of sedges that actually would have the grass-like texture, and those are ones that, that um, will tolerate the shade. Pennsylvania sedge comes to mind as one of those. So again, you know, to be able to seed a ground cover, may be able to find a source for some seed for, for those particular plants, uh, at least the second two, but it's probably pretty unlikely. And it'll be a lot of crossing of fingers and paying attention and hoping we don't get a lot of those gully washer kinds of rains. We're going to wrap up this week's episode by hearing again from Extension Turf Specialist Cole Thompson about keeping your lawn weed free. Spring will soon be upon us. That means we're all going to be seeing a dandelion or two or 200. You can do a few herbicide treatments in the spring to knock them back, but here's Cole to tell us that fall broadleaf weed control of these dandelions is really a much better option. Broadleaf weeds are a common problem in home lawns. And the problem is that most people consider controlling broadleaf weeds in the spring. And frankly, that's just not the best time of year to control broadleaf weeds. Uh, the fall is preferred for a number of reasons, uh, but one of the main reasons is because of the many different life cycles of weeds that are encompassed within the term broadleaf weed. Uh, broadleaf weeds uh, in, contain weeds with life cycles in winter annual, summer annual, and also perennial life cycles. Uh, summer annuals are maturing now this time of year and setting seed and they'll be dead uh, or killed by the first frost. And so we don't need to worry about controlling these weeds right now. We want to get them with the pre-emergence herbicide in spring. Uh, in fall, the weeds that we're going to really try to control are those in the winter annual and perennial life cycles. Winter annual weeds, such as chickweed, uh, common or mouse ear chickweed, are germinating this time of year and they will mature throughout the winter before setting seed in spring and dying. Uh, so they're small this time of year and easier controlled, uh, more easily controlled I should say. Uh, perennial weeds are also more easily controlled this time of year because they're translocating stored energy downward to below ground uh, plant parts such as roots and tubers. 
Another reason that fall is the preferred time to control broadleaf weeds is because by applying herbicide this time of year, we are reducing the risk for damaging other landscape plants or non-target agricultural plants. And so again, because people tend to notice weeds in their lawn during the spring, they get excited about weed control that time of year. But right now, during September or October, is really the best time of year to control these weeds. And so as always, we, the best weed control or weed management program begins with proper turf grass management. And so this includes uh, proper fertility and mowing height and frequency and uh, judicious irrigation practices throughout the year to encourage a healthy growing lawn that's going to resist weed infestation. Um, after cultural management, there are herbicides that we can use to control these weeds. Uh, there are commonly available uh, pre-mixed products that contain active ingredients such as 2,4-D, dicamba, uh, or MCPP. And these are available, again, usually in two or three-way mixtures. And they offer pretty broad spectrum control for a number of broadleaf weeds. Uh, for very difficult to control weeds, uh, perennials such as ground ivy, or maybe you've heard it called creeping charlie, uh, or even a wild violet, uh, the active ingredient triclopyr or products containing triclopyr or fluoroxapyr are going to be most effective for these weeds. So although it may be counterintuitive, try to get excited about controlling broadleaf weeds in your lawn this fall and then you won't have to worry about the flowers that you normally see in the spring. It's winter and there's not much of anything growing out there right now. But weeds in our turf are going to be a problem and we just want you to keep in mind that if you're going to use herbicide applications for broadleaf weeds, the fall application will give you much better results and keep that lawn green, not dandelion yellow in the spring. Thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. Next time we'll show you some fall color in the garden and talk about how a look-alike ornamental grass can really be hazardous to the environment. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good day, good gardening, thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.